So for a while now, we've been learning about the method of using Venn diagrams in order to prove whether or not a categorical syllogism is valid or invalid. But what we've overlooked up to this point is any of the reasons why this method works. We haven't gotten into the rules that govern validity or invalidity for categorical syllogisms. And there's a reason I hadn't looked at the rules first. If you actually look at the textbook, it goes over the rules for uh, validity for categorical syllogisms, and then it comes around to using Venn diagrams. But I don't like that order for the simple reason that, to me, using the Venn diagrams is something that's easier to remember. Uh, so it's just for a practical reason. Uh, when you learn to do Venn diagrams, you know, we've been learning the, uh, how to use Venn diagrams for a while, um, for instance, we learned to use Venn diagrams to, in order to show whether or not categorical propositions were equivalent. Uh, and it's the exact same method. Uh, it's just a little bit uh, more of it when we turn to testing validity. And what I like about the Venn diagrams is that once you really catch how to do it, I know catching it can be a little uh, difficult at first, but once you catch it, it's actually quite simple. Uh, you just do the same thing every time. Uh, you just do maybe more of it when we're doing uh, when testing for validity. And so for me, you know, it's easier to remember. I actually, even I, after having taught this for a while, sometimes forget these rules uh, because they're just one is different from the next, and so it's it's kind of hard to to remember them all or to keep them straight. But I can always remember how to do Venn diagrams. So if there's ever a, a, a time in my life where I'm not so sure about whether or not an argument is actually valid or invalid. Well, I can always draw up the diagram, even though I might not be able to recall the rules. Um, but it's important to learn both of them because it's important to not only be able to show that something is invalid, it's also important to be able to explain to someone else why it is, to explain, well, what, what rule it violates. And so that's what we're going to uh, work on in this video lecture. We're going to look at a bit of the rules behind uh, validity for categorical syllogisms. Now before we get to the rules, there's going to be a very important concept that we have to understand. And it's honestly pretty simple once it's explained for everything, but there's one example where it's not actually simple and you're just going to have to trust me. Um, but we're going to have to learn about the concept of what's called distribution. Now, if it hasn't been clear to you up to this point, we are dealing with the logic that involves the classes of things. When you have a, a statement like all S are P, S represents a class of things. P represents a class of things. And when we have an argument where we have something like all, all you know, M or P, all S or M, therefore all S or P, we are dealing with three different classes. S is a class of things, P is a class of things, M is a class of things. And we're trying to draw an inference on the basis of the relationship between those various classes. So we're dealing with the logic of classes of things. And in order for that logic to work, we have to have definitive information uh, about the members of, of the classes of things. I mean, take for example, if you had an argument like, uh, let's say sum m r p and let's say, whoa I'm getting carried away sum uh, sum m r s and then we conclude it you know sum s r p uh, now there are a lot of things going wrong with this argument but one of the things that's wrong with it is the quantifiers in here none of them tell us any definitive information. And if you were to draw up a Venn diagram of this, um, truthfully, there's no way, uh, even if you rearrange you know, the middle term and the, and the um, major term, and you rearrange you know, this, the middle term and the minor term in some combination, there's no way you could ever get an argument like this to work because the quantifier in each case is just saying sum. And the reason that that's problematic is you're never at any point given any definitive information about the middle term, the major term, or the minor term. And in order to draw an inference, at some point we do have to be given definitive information about one of uh, these classes, at least one of these classes, if not more than one of the classes. So I'm saying that because it's going to be important when we understand distribution. 
because what it means for a term to be distributed is that we're told some, something definitive about all the members of the class. Distribution, I should say, is a property of the terms of the proposition. So it's going to be, when we're talking about distribution, it's going to be a property of the subject term or it's going to be a property of the predicate term. Uh, note that in the past we've talked about properties of the proposition as a whole, right? In the past we talked about the quality, for instance. Uh, you might recall quality is negative or affirmative. Uh, but the quality is a, is a property of this entire proposition right here. We also talked about the quantity, right, which is going to be universal or particular. Again, that's a property of the entire proposition. This proposition here, it is affirmative and it is universal. That is a property of this entire statement. But there are also properties of just the terms, the subject term or of just the predicate term. And one of those properties, the, the one we're going to talk about, is that it can be distributed or not distributed. Uh, and basically what it means for it to be distributed is that we know something about all the members of the class. Uh, we know something about all the members of the class. So take a statement like the following. We'll just stick with uh, an A form proposition. Suppose I said all cats are friendly, if I can get this to work, animals. So I know that's just so poorly written, but anyways, all cats are friendly animals. Think about this for a second. We have two classes of things. We have the class of cats, which, you know, the group of cats. We also have the group of friendly animals, right? Now, it, well, shoot, you can't see that. Um, I drew that below where you can see. So we have the class of cats. We have the class of friendly animals, F-A and C. Now, think about this statement for a second. All cats are friendly animals. Do we know something? If, just suppose this statement is true. I know some of you hate cats, and I know it's actually not even true because some cats are actually kind of mean. But let's suppose this statement is true. Assuming that it's true, would we know something about every single cat that exists? Will we know something about all, every single cat? And the answer to that is clearly yes. Um, we would, if this statement is true, because it's saying all cats are friendly animals, right? Every single one of them is friendly. So we would know something about all cats. And because we know something about every single cat, this term, the subject term, it is distributed. We'd say this term is distributed. Now, would we know something about all friendly animals? Well, we know something about every single friendly animals if this statement is true. No, we wouldn't because maybe, you know, it could be true that all cats are friendly animals. It could also be true that all dogs are friendly animals and all, I don't know, what's something else? Uh, I'm trying to think of something random. Uh, meek rats or something, right? Maybe all, all meek rats are friendly animals too. So the point here is when we have an A-form proposition, the subject term is distributed, but the predicate term is not distributed. We don't know something about every single member of the predicate term. And this is true for every single A-form proposition. And every single A-form proposition, it's always going to be the case that the subject term is distributed and the predicate term is not distributed. And you can think about this in another way, and some of you are about to flip out. But if you were to do a Venn diagram, I know you're so sick of these, and you had something like this, right? How would you show that all cats are friendly things? Assuming cats is S and friendly animals is P, you'd shade in region one, right? So you look at this right here. And what definitive information do we have? Uh, about which regions? Well, we have definitive information about region 1. Um, we don't have definitive information about 3. We do have some definitive information about 2, right? W namely that um, all S that exist are in 2. But we don't know 
anything really about three whatsoever. We don't know anything. And because we, you know, we're, let's say we say S is one and two, um, we do know something definitive about that and about that. Um, P is two and three. Well, we know something definitive about two, but not about three. We don't know something definitive. We don't know anything about three at that point. So uh, this is um, why the predicate term is not distributed, because we can't say for sure anything about the part of uh, P. There's a part of P that's just beyond uh, the scope of our knowledge, given this statement right here. Now, it may turn out you know, that we are given additional information later on. Maybe, let's say somebody was making an argument and they said, you know, all cats are friendly things, all friendly things are uh, fun to be around, right? Well, then, you know, we would have definitive information about friendly things. But it, would, it still wouldn't change the fact that in this proposition right here, that we didn't have definitive information about P. So in this proposition, the subject term, and this is true across the board for all A-form propositions, the subject term is always distributed, the predicate term is never distributed. All right, well, let me erase this because we need to look at more propositions in order to say whether or not what we can know. So let's take uh, a proposition like this one. We'll take an E form. No S is P, right? No S is P. Now, here's the question. If you say no S is P, let's say no, we'll just use a, a sentence that, you know, no cat is friendly. Uh, I should say a friendly Oh, goodness. And my uh, stylist is being a bit difficult here. Anyways, that's supposed to be an animal, but for some reason, my stylist is not cooperating here. Let's see. I don't know. It's not cooperating, but it's supposed to be no cat is a friendly animal. Uh, but let's assume that this statement is true. Now, Based on this, do we know something about all cats that exist? If I say uh, no cat is a friendly animal, do I know something about every cat that exists? Well, yeah, I actually do. Because I know if I were focusing on the class of cats, that no, nothing in this group right here is a part of this group right here. Um, I know that nothing in this group is a part of anything in this group right here. So, I, yes, I do know something about all cats. Um, how about the class of friendly animals? Do I know something about all of those? And the answer is yes, I do know, because I know namely that nothing in here is in here, right? I know that nothing in here is in here. And so for that reason, both of these terms are distributed. The subject term is distributed and the predicate term is distributed. Because if I say no cat is a friendly animal, I know that uh, nothing in, in the class of cats will belong to the class of friendly animals. Likewise, I know that nothing in the class of friendly animals belongs to the class of cats. Now, some of you might be uh, being lured into a false sense of, of hope here because you're like... This. Some of you might be thinking there's something more complicated to this because it may seem so easy, but it, it, it really is just this is just as easy. Um, uh, when you have a, a, an e-form proposition, for all e-form propositions, in both, of, in both the subject term and the predicate term, um, they are always both distributed for an e-form proposition. So a-form proposition, it's only the subject term, never the predicate term. E-form both of them are distributed. So, uh, and you just, you, you can always use examples. You know, I think if, if you forget what's going on here, uh, use an example, a concrete example, and that'll help you. You know, if you said something like, you know, uh, I don't know, no fish have lungs. Well, do you know something about, uh, or no fish are uh, animals with lungs? If you said something like that, would you know something about all fish that exist. Well, yeah, you know something about all the fish, namely that none of them have lungs. Would you know something about all uh, animals with lungs? Yeah, namely that none of them are fish. So uh, a, a universal negation, uh, an e-form proposition, 
both the subject and the predicate term always distributed. Well, let's look at an I-form proposition, sum S, R, P. Um, suppose you said, you know, we can, and we'll go back to my favorite example, some cats are friendly animals. Uh, in this case, would you know something about all members of the class of cats, all members of the subject term? If I said some cats are friendly animals, well, no, you wouldn't know something about every single cat on the planet. You would know something about some, well, some of them are. Um, but you wouldn't know something about all of them. And so for that reason, this in this proposition, in an I-form proposition, the subject term is not distributed. Or, or you might say undistributed. Sometimes you, you hear people say not distributed. Uh, sometimes you hear undistributed. Same thing. Um, and so, uh, anyways, but it's not distributed. Now, would you know something about all members of the class of uh, friendly animals. Would you, if I said some cats are friendly animals, well, no, you wouldn't know something about every single friendly animal on the planet. And so again, this term is not distributed. It's not distributed. So when it comes to all I form propositions, neither the subject term nor the predicate term are ever distributed. In neither case will you ever see either one of them distributed. It just never works out that way. So already you can kind of see what's going on here. In an A-form proposition, the subject term is always distributed. In an E-term, and, and, and the predicate term never distributed. E-form proposition, both are distributed. I-form proposition, neither one is distributed. Now, let's come to the final categorical proposition, which is, of course, our O form proposition. We're going to do O form. And that is some S are not P. And again, we'll go with our example some cats are not friendly animals. All right? And so let's think about this. If you said some cats are not friendly animals, some cats are not friendly animals, would you know something about all the cats that exist? Would you know something about all the cats? Nope, you would know some cats are not friendly, but it you wouldn't know something about all the cats that exist. And so for that reason, the subject term is not distributed, all right? Well, what about the class of friendly animals? Would you know something about all the friendly animals that existed? And this is the one curveball I'm going to throw you because a lot of you already said no, but that's not right. Um, because the answer is, in this case, yes, you would. Now, you, I know some of you don't believe me at all when I say this, and I, if I can't make this make sense, you just this might be one case where you just have to memorize what I'm telling you and just trust that it's right. But you actually do know something about all the members of the class of friendly animals. And you can think about it this way. Suppose we had, you know, our classes here and we diagram this, you know, with our x here. This shows us that some cats are not friendly animals. And here's why the predicate term it is distributed. Yes, distribute it. Because let's say that, you know, there is this cat right here that is not friendly. All right, and we're going to call that cat Larry. Um, that's just this cat's name. Well, what we know is that for all the members of this class right here, the class of P, for every single member in this class, and we could draw, uh, I don't know how to draw a cat. Um, how would you draw a cat? Like this? And here's his tail, and his ears, and some whiskers. All right, so there's my cat. Um, and let's say, you know, for every single cat that exists in this group, none of these cats are identical with our boy Larry right here. So for all of these cats within this group, none are identical with Larry. 
Uh, and if that doesn't make sense to you, you may just have to memorize this. I know I did for a long time and I just trusted that it worked. I trusted the people who came before me knew what they were talking about. But in an O-form proposition, the subject term is not distributed and the predicate term, it is distributed. This is the, this is the one out of the four that makes the least sense. I feel like the other three is pretty intuitive, but this one, you have to really stop and think about it. Um, but if you pause for a second and you reflect on it, like I said, basically what's going on here is that when you say some cats are not friendly animals, uh, no member of this class, the class of friendly animals, is identical with that particular individual or group of individuals, that none of them are. And so for that reason, we do know something about uh, all of these, uh, all of the members of this class, namely that none of them are this guy right here. None of them are that guy. So um, that is distribution in a nutshell. And let's take this thing off. And what we have here is we have a summary of uh, distribution. And you can see uh, it laid out very clearly on the PowerPoint here. Uh, the subject term for an A form proposition, yes, always distributed. Predicate term, never distributed. E form, yes and yes. I form, no and no. And then O form, no and yes. Now, it's very important that you remember distribution because this is going to be vital for understanding all of the rules, or at least most of the rules, for validity, for categorical syllogisms. And I'm going to walk through these, and there are a handful of rules, so we'll just go through them. And I know we're moving fast from talking about distribution to talking about the rules. Uh, so you might have to stop and, and maybe even uh, write this chart right here down, um, because as we go over the rules, um, we're going to be relying on this, this chart right here. So it might be helpful for you to just quickly pause the PowerPoint, write this chart down so you can have it in front of you, or actually... Um, if you look in your book, I believe it is uh, the chart you'll find. You, I'll save you a step here. Um, well, I thought it was in your book somewhere. Yes, if you were to look on um, page uh, 189 in your book, uh, you'll see that uh, it has uh, the, um, the terms that are distributed at the top of the page it has them highlighted and in bold. So you don't need to write it down. If you just look on page 189, you'll see it there. All right. So let's look at some of these rules. And the first rule we're going to cover, and this is not being presented because it's you know, any more important than any of the, of the other rules, it's just the first one we come to, is that the middle term must be distributed in at least one of the premises. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be distributed in both, but it must be distributed in at least one. So let's take a look at an argument. All P are M, all S are M, therefore all S are P. Now, if you look at your chart with the rules for distribution, you will recall that for any A form proposition, the subject term is distributed, the predicate term isn't. And we notice right here, the P is distributed, but M isn't. The S is distributed, the minor term is distributed, but the middle term isn't. And so uh, in this argument, what we have basically done is we violated this rule that the middle term has to be distributed in at least one premise. And if you think about some of the stuff I was saying earlier, that we are uh, coming to or trying to use a logic that involves the classes of things, if we're never told anything definitively true about one of the classes we're talking about, how are we ever going to make a valid inference uh, in any kind of way? If we're trying to make a valid inference about the relationship of S and P, and we're using the middle term as a bridge to move from S to P or P to S, but we don't know anything definitive about M, we're never going to make a valid inference. So this is guilty of a certain fallacy. And if you recall from a long time ago, a fallacy is any mistake in reasoning. Um, but this is a, it's called a formal fallacy, not formal because it wears a tuxedo, but formal because the form, the structure of the argument is messed up. Uh, and it's a formal fallacy 
um, that goes by the name of the fallacy of undistributed middle term. I know, very creatively named, creative, creative, creatively named. Man, I was struggling to say that. Uh, but this is the fallacy of seeing that the or noticing that the middle term has not been distributed in either one of the premises. Remember, it does not have to be distributed in both, but it has to be distributed in at least one. Um, this argument wouldn't be guilty of that fallacy, for instance, if we reverse, let's say, the S and the M. Uh, in that case, it would not be distributed. And uh, I mean, it would be distributed in the minor term. Um, this argument right here has the form A, 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 figure 2. Uh, and this, fi this argument, no matter what you put in place of M, no matter what you put in place of S or in P, it would always be invalid. It is a fallacy of undistributed middle term. All right, rule number two. If a term is distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in a premise. So, if, so just think about that for a second. If you have a term and it is distributed in the conclusion, it has to be distributed in the premise in, in which it occurs. So if you have a conclusion in which the major term is distributed, then it has to be distributed in the major premise. If you have a conclusion in which the minor term is distributed, uh, it has to be distributed in the minor premise. If you have a conclusion in which both the minor and major term are distributed, for instance, if you had no S is P, uh, then they would have to be distributed in both the premises. So here's an example. All uh, Look at the conclusion first. All S are P, all right? All S are P. Uh, in this case, um, this minor term has been distributed. Now, the major term has not been. Remember, because in an A-form proposition, subject always distributed, predicate never distributed. This is distributed here, but notice if we look up here, it has not been distributed in this premise. Remember, subject in an A-form proposition, subject always distributed, predicate never is. So here we have a fallacy that occurs. Now I want to just back up a slide um, and show you this. Remember I said we could avoid the fallacy of undistributed middle term if we reversed M and S. But notice if we did that, then we're actually going to run headlong into this next fallacy because just this argument, if we reverse the S and the M, would be the argument that's on the next screen. We'd have the subject term or the minor term being distributed in the conclusion, but not in the minor premise. And I want you to think about what you this might be called uh, for a second. Um, since it's the minor term that is creating the, the worries here because it's distributed here, and it's not being distributed up here, this fallacy is called fallacy of illicit minor term, or fallacy of illicit minor. Or you could call it fallacy of undistributed minor term. Um, most of the time people just call it illicit minor. And you'll just hear that as shorthand um, for what the fallacy is. So that is uh, the fallacy that is occurring here. Um, like I said, if you have, um, you could have it uh, in another direction where maybe the, the subject term has been distributed, but the predicate term hasn't been distributed. Um, so think about, well, this isn't going to demonstrate that, but think about this argument right here. If I said no S, I, I should say is P, the subject term is being distributed, so it has to be distributed up here. And yep, it is being distributed up here. Uh, notice also the middle term is being distributed here. Um, but the P term is being distributed, the predicate term, the major term is being distributed in the conclusion. Is the major term distributed up here? And the answer to that is no. Um, while the major term is, since the major term is distributed in the conclusion, it has to be distributed in the major premise, and it isn't. And for that reason, um, we have a fallacy, and this is called the fallacy of illicit major term. You know, if you called it undistributed major term or uh, you know, something like that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain too much. But it's the fallacy of undistributed major term or illicit major term, and. You know, I know we have two fallacies that are being generated from this one rule, but if you can remember this, if something's distributed in the, in the conclusion, that term has to be distributed in the premise in which it occurs. Um, that's really the mistake that's going on here. So that's rule number two. Um, rule number three, no valid syllogism can have two negative premises. 
no valid syllogism can have two negative premises. This is the one that students oftentimes have the easiest to remember, uh, or easiest time of remembering. But there are a couple of ways this can occur, but just look at this right here. No S or M, no P or M, therefore no S uh, is P. Um, and here it's just really easy to see. We have two negative premises occurring. And the problem here is when you have two negative premises, basically you're completely excluding classes from one another. While you are being given definitive information, it's all negative. And so since it's all negative, it's going to be impossible to determine that, that, that something is true. If I'm, just, if I'm just saying, well, this class is excluded from that class and that class is excluded from this other class, um, we're not being given a bridge in any way to link um, the S and P term because we're saying, well, S is excluded from M, M is excluded from P, but now we don't have a bridge to, to um, uh, combine S and P in any kind of way. We basically just said there's nothing um, in those two uh, classes. So there's nothing that links those two classes, I should say. And that's one way this occurs. Um, here's another way. No S is M. Some S are not M. Therefore, some S are not P. Um, notice here uh, that this is a negative premise um, because this is an O form proposition. The R not indicates that it's negative. And even though, um, I don't know, I was going to say even though, but I don't know what I was going to say. It's just negative. You can't have two negative premises. This doesn't have any kind of fancy name. It's just the fallacy of two negative premises. Uh, and I think that's pretty straight. Sorry, I clicked too quickly. That's just pretty straightforward and easy to remember. Just, just recall the one trick here is that there are two ways you can have two negative premises. Actually, I guess you know a couple of different combinations. Either you could have you know an O form proposition um, with well, actually you could have two E form propositions. You could have two. An, you could have an E form proposition and an O form proposition. Or you could have two O form propositions. I could have had, you know, some S R. Well, this is this argument's bad because it's not even in standard form. Sorry, I just noticed that. Um, but you could have, you know, some P R not M, some S R not M. You could have two O form propositions also. Um, sorry, I don't know why this argument's not in standard form. That's my mistake. But all right. Um, Third or fourth rule, if either premise is neg negative, the conclusion must be negative. And if the conclusion is negative, at least one premise must be negative. Um, I call this rule, um, after myself, Newton's conservation of negativity, just as a joke. Uh, but basically, the idea is if you have negative premises, you got to have a negative conclusion. And if you have a negative conclusion, you got to have a negative premise somewhere. And you can kind of think about that for a second. I mean, if your conclusion is, you know, no S is P, and then your premises are just like all um, M or P, all S or M, therefore no S is P, how in the hell do you get a negative from two positives, right? Um, you know, you can even kind of think about this with um, mathematics. You couldn't say two times three equals negative six. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so if you have, you, can, you can't get negative from two positives, just, you know, the same if you have one negative. If you said two times negative three equals six, well, that's not going to make any sense, right? Um, two times negative three doesn't equal six. It's going to equal a negative. If you have a negative in there somewhere, you're going to get a negative that spits out later on. So with this argument, uh, you can see right here, affirmative uh, premise, but then a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. So this violates the first part of this um, rule up here. Um, because one premise is negative, therefore the conclusion must be negative. So this is um, very uncreative, creatively named. I am having trouble with the word creative today. It's the fallacy of a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. Very simple. All right, here's another one. All M are S, all M are P, therefore some P are not S. Wow, this is out of, this argument is just way out of whack too. I don't know what, I must have been drunk when I wrote this. I'm sorry. Um, not that I do that, but anyways, uh, this is just not in standard form either, so forgive me for that. Um, but you can see here that the, the problem is that we have two affirmative propositions and then we're drawing a, a, negative affirmative, uh, a negative proposition down here. And like I said, you can't say 1 times 1 uh, it equals negative 1. That doesn't work. Um, it just doesn't work. So this would be the fallacy of affirmative premises 
and a negative conclusion. Pretty simple. All right, uh, and I think this is the final fallacy we're going to come to. But this is the fallacy. Um, it says, if the conclusion um, of a valid syllogism is particular, uh, I'm sorry, if the conclusion of it is particular, one premise must be particular. So I kind of got tripped up in my words. Basically, if you have a syllogism and the conclusion is particular, either it's some S or P or some S or not P. So if you have a particular conclusion, you have to have at least one premise that is particular. You have to have at least one premise that is particular. So look at this right here. All M are P. All P are M. God dang it. This is out of uh, order too. Um, it should reverse one and two here. Therefore, some S are P. Uh, now with this one, this is not a valid syllogism. And the reason for that is due to the fact that what we have going on down here is we have a particular conclusion that we are deriving from uh, from two universal statements. And you can even think about this with respect to your um, uh, Venn diagrams. Think about what you would do. In, in a Venn diagram, you would shade, um, well, you'd shade the major premise, which I have listed secondly here incorrectly. You'd shade the minor premise, and then you'd put an X for the conclusion. And so right there, that should tell you, oh, this isn't going to work, right? It's not going to work um, because whenever you have a, a particular uh, statement, you're actually making what we call an existential claim. This is something I haven't really made a big deal out of. But if I say something like some cats are friendly, I'm actually saying something uh, concrete about the world around us. Uh, I, I, made a, I said a little bit about this before, but when you make... Um, uh, claims like universal claims like all or no that doesn't necessarily imply anything that is true in the actual world for instance it can it's true that all unicorns have a single horn or a, or all unicorns are single horned animals we'll make we'll do one thing right today um, that's a true statement but it doesn't make any implication about things in the actual world I'm not saying there are any unicorns that exist but if I said some unicorns have a single horn, what well, that does have some kind of existential import. Um, it is making, it does seem to be implying that there are unicorns in the world. Um, I think I may have mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again because I just find it so bizarre and funny. But back in like the 1980s, Ringland Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, they claimed they had discovered a unicorn, and I think they just took like a, a little pony and glued a horn on its head. I, you might be able to go find images online. But I remember um, seeing this as a kid and just thinking, God, this is so fake. Who would, who would believe this? But I guess they made money on it, so some idiots believed it. But in any event, this you can't derive a particular conclusion from two universal propositions. Uh, it wouldn't matter if you know I had no, no, and then some. That wouldn't work. Uh, or if I had you know no, no, some, not, wouldn't change a thing. Um, anytime you have universal, universal, regardless if they're affirmative or negative, and you have a particular, regardless if it's affirmative or negative, you have a fallacy here. Um, uh, oh, I have a concrete example here. All mammals are animals. All unicorns are, are mammals. Therefore, some unicorns are animals. Um, it just it just doesn't follow here because it, we don't know anything definite. I'm, I'm sorry. There just aren't unicorns that exist. This this conclusion is false. You can see here that, that what the fallacy is going on because all mammals are animals, true. All unicorns are mammals. Well, that's true too, um, but it's just false that some unicorns are animals because it's unicorns don't exist, right? Sorry, I know some of you are um, f you know, um, you know, big fans of My Little Pony. Um, I, I don't they have unicorns? Some of you may be bronies. Um, you know, there's a male um, bros who like My Little Ponies, I don't know. But um, no unicorns, sorry to burst anyone's bubble. But this is called the existential fallacy. I know existential sounds like a big word, but it's just it just means exist, right? That's all it means, the fallacy of uh, the existential fallacy. If you want to remember this longer name, you can remember fallacy of universal premise and uh, particular conclusion. Um, or you can just remember existential fallacy. But the basic idea here is that if you have a particular conclusion, you have to have at least one particular premise. 
You cannot have a particular conclusion and two universal premises. It does not work. All right, well, that's all um, we have for this time, ladies and gentlemen. But here's your homework assignment. Um, now, I want to uh, call your attention to um, uh, what's on page 195 at exercise 7.4b. Um, all I want you to do for this one is just to, um, you look, you'll see there's a long list of um, uh, things that ask you to do here. But I just want you to, for this one, to basically put the argument into standard form and then determine whether or not it's valid or invalid. And if it is invalid, state the rule that it violates. Now, when it says state the rule, I don't want you to state rule one, rule two. I want you to name the rule it violates. So uh, existential fallacy, fallacy of undistributed middle, uh, fallacy of illicit major, fallacy of two negative premises, something like that. So uh, I want you to state the fallacy that it violates if it violates a, a fallacy at all.